I came twice to the New Haven area. First, I came in, I think it was just before Halloween 1961, the day before Halloween. I was with the office of Ero Sarinen, with Ero Sarinen. And Sarinen had decided to move to the office from Michigan, where we were, Bloomfield Hills, Michigan, to New Haven. He was in Michigan because his father had created the Cranbrook Academy of Art and had been the president of the Academy of Art, built a great, lovely house for himself as president in Cranbrook, where Ero grew up. Actually, actually, Ero came to America when he was 15 years old, 14 years old, so he must have been about 17 years old when he moved to Cranbrook or 18 years old. He studied there. Then he had a first wife, a sculptress, Lily Swan. Things did not work out, they divorced. Finally, Ero married Aileen Sarine, who had gone there to interview him. Aileen was the first sort of architectural critic of the New York Times, and a very New Yorker person. And she couldn't stand living in Michigan, so that she wanted to be back here. Also, the office of Sarinen was getting more international scope projects, and he needed to be close to his consultants in New York City. Ero actually wrote a page of analysis, why, what should we do, where should the office move? He did not want to be in New York or near New York. He was very worried about what he called visiting firemen that were going to distract him from his work. And so, uh, but so that the so solution was to be near enough New York, less than two hours away, so that you could go into New York to meet with clients or consultants, easily clients could come wherever he was. But over an hour away so that people would not just drop into the office just to bother him. And they concluded that there were three possible places. And oh, he wanted to be also where there was a university with a school of architecture and with a, with a cultural life, he says, for the spouses of the people working for him. And they concluded that there were only three possible places, Princeton, Philadelphia, or New Haven. But he was a graduate of the School of Architecture, so he was definitely, the dice were not, were loaded. And he sent a chap, I remember one of our designers, Kent Cooper, who at that time was in Washington, D.C., following the construction of the Dallas Airport, to look at properties. And he found this wonderful property of the Graves family on, on Davis, Davis Street in Hampton. And Aero directed the design of the new office there, ready to move, but about three weeks before we were supposed to move, he went to the doctor because he had very strong headaches. He had planned a trip to, to England with his wife, Aileen, and from there coming back to New Haven. One of the designers had already put all of his luggage in a had moved out of his house, put his luggage in a, in a van, in a, trans, in a moving company. And Aero went to the hospital and they discovered he had a very advanced tumor in his brain. And they asked Sarin, should we operate? If we operate, a very dangerous operation, because he could die in the operation room. If we don't operate, he will not be able to decide because the tumor is affecting his ability to think. So she decided that they should operate, and he died indeed in the operating room. So that question was, the main inherited partner was a chap called Joe Lacey, who was his business partner. Also secondarily was, Kevin, was John Dinkalo. And the two of them had to decide what to do then. Neither of them was a designer. John Dinkel was more of a practical man, how to get the buildings put together carefully and intelligently. And, and Joe Lacey was a, a primarily in charge of business. So they decided to go ahead with the move anyway. And they came to Hamden, Connecticut, and I, it was offered to us to come whoever wanted to. 
and about half the office decided to come, and I decided to come, and I moved. I, we found a, a lovely house in North Haven on Dixwell Avenue. Lovely because house was falling apart, but we had about 10 acres of an abandoned apple orchard covered completely, the trees all covered with poison ivy. <laughs> Fantastic, we loved it. And uh, so while I was there, I was, as, as you say, I lived in North Haven and I used to come to Hamden. I did not come quite to, to downtown except to come to the university. Paul Rudolph, who was the dean of the School of Architecture, asked me to help teach in one semester just before I went to California. I was offered a job in, in California to be director of design of a large company called Daniel Mann Johnson and Mendenhall, DMJM or DIMJM, that's how we all called it. Uh, but Paul Rudolph asked me to teach here, and that was my connection with the School of Architecture. I had a connection, I had met with the Griswold here, and, and, I had, uh, and, and I had met Kingman Brewster. When I met Kingman Brewster, he was only the provost at that time. He was just made provost. He replaced a chap called Steve Buck, who was the previous provost with whom we had been working through a visa. But then I moved to California. But then Paul Rudolph wrote to me asking me if I would come for a semester to teach and then then, then came Charles Moore. Charles Moore never contacted me. He did not know me. But he was followed by Hermann Spiegel. And Hermann Spiegel also asked me to come and teach. So I came in 72 and 74 to, to teach a semester. And somehow they liked my style or whatever I was doing. And in 1976, Kingman Brewster appeared in my house in Santa Monica, California with a very important potential donor. For some reason, he just carried him and to ask me if I would come as dean of the School of Architecture here, and I agreed. So I came finally in December 1976. Those are my two periods that I have known New Haven. Very different New Haven in the early, in the early 60s or in the late 70s. It's a huge change at that time. In the, uh, when I came in the early 60s, the mayor was Richard Lee, who was a brilliant man, a fantastic man. I really had, a, and I still do, great admiration for Richard Lee. And he bought the best advice possible. He had as director of planning Ed Logue, very important man, and Ed Logue also very, very great doer. Unfortunately, they were sold in ideas of modernism or city planning, which were dreadful. That, that, that's why they supported the Oak Street Connector, who was a disaster, and they did many other disastrous things in, this, in the city, but with the best of intentions. That's why you, one of your questions is, what do I think about urban planning in New Haven? And it's very dangerous. The, 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 one, the one example of urban planning in New Haven has, was disastrous. Uh, the, and, uh, and I still think that I, I am surprised that Richard Lee did not become governor. He, he was a brilliant politician. Oh, when I came back in the late 60s, we used to occasionally get together and have lunch at the Q Club. That was his favorite place. We couldn't change two words. Somebody would came by, and always Richard would ask him, how is your wife so-and-so, and your children so-and-so? Did he get the scholarship? He, was asked. he remembered everybody. Amazing chap, real politician. <laughs> I cannot remember the name of anybody. <laughs> so I could not be a politician. <laughs> people from New Haven want to go somewhere else. We, we are, but we attract, we have always some people from New Haven, but some people from Yale, but not as much as we used to. Uh, we attract people from all over the place. We, we have people from almost every country. You can think of every, every continent you can think of. And we have a steady group of students, of very good kids that come from two OSUs, Ohio State University and Oklahoma State University. They both sent us very, very good students, wonderful, from the, from the School of Architecture. Both come, pre and that's the key, that they come pre-selected. We have somebody there at Ohio State, we have a chap called Rob Lisi, 
who taught with me at, at the School of Architecture here, that, that he was dean for many years, and he still remains the most important figure in the, in the, in the school, and he's, he picks up two or three youngsters to come and work with us. And the same thing in, in, in Oklahoma. We designed there in, in Tulsa a large event center, so we made contacts with the University of Oklahoma. And they send us, we also we have people that say, come from Argentina. I first worked on a project in Rochester and then worked a little on, the, on the, what became the Richard Lee High School. But this was, those were Kevin Roach's work. By that time, by, by that time, Lacey and Dinkelow had asked Kevin Roach to join the firm. And, and then Lacey was bought out and, and it became Kevin Roach and Dinkelow and Associates. And, uh, and I went to Los Angeles. When I came back, was a, was a whole different, the, the architects, were, when I was first here, the main architects were probably Douglas Orr and Pedersen Tilney. Those were the main firms in New Haven, but New York architects were doing much of the work in New Haven at that time. When I came in the late 70s, New Haven was in not, not in a very good shape. It was actually it was a rather dangerous city. <laughs> We have been in the same space here since we, the office opened. Actually, not in this particular, we were in a tiny corner in this same floor. Morrison style were designed, were designed in Michigan. We, we were completely designed in Michigan and they were built while I was in Michigan, yes. And I was in charge of that project. So I did work. That's how I met with Nick Rizzo, and then that's how, that's how I met Kingman Brewster, because I was working on that project. It was fairly run down, and, and, and the space, there were two high schools at that time, but the site was not very adequate for the colleges. It required to cramp two colleges, and Aero was very concerned that the colleges would be seen as in Siberia because they were behind the raw shops. Fortunately, they, 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 and he was hoping to cut a path through the corner of the site, through the corner of York and Broadway to cut a diagonal path that would take you directly to the colleges. Instead of that, there is now a narrow path that goes by Morris, where Herb Newman's office is, and there is another path next to the, what was the Yale Co-op, now, now is Barnes & Noble. But the, the fortunate that the Yale Co-op decided to move so that Aero could design a building there, uh, which served as a buffer for the, co for the college, for styles, and the noise of Broadway. So the two colleges are quite, quite quiet, and they were very cheap. So when Aero started designing, he wanted to know how much would it cost to replicate the Hacktress Quadrangle in, in the early 60s. In 1961, was when construction was supposed to start. Like he had a cost estimator estimate, and a cost estimate to figure out that the Hartest Quadrangle building would cost between 100 and 120 dollars a square foot to build. And Aero had a budget of 21 dollars a square foot. <laughs> so that nothing like what the older colleges was. He had to figure out how to do something with that little money. And he invented that technology of the stone that was, at that time, that was cheaper than brick. And he was a stone building. It looked different than what we had mocked up in, in Michigan, because it's the way that they washed the stone to make it three-dimensional did not work. They were supposed to wash it with very high-pressure water. And the high pressure water just made the slurry run down and make, because they built from the bottom up. And as you wash the stone on the top, it would make a mess of the stone below. So that they decided instead to scrape it. And by scraping it, it's, it's a rather flatter wall, more like adobe than what we had seen before. <laughs> one, actually, one of my favorite places is just outside. As you come in, through either in front of the, by, by the Yale, by the old Yale Co, by Barnes and Noble or by Boris, I design a circle 
of ginkgo trees, I don't remember they were ginkgos or, or what ended up being beaches, I think beaches, beaches, and with a mound in the middle, and they were built. The mound has disappeared, has become flat, but the circle of trees still remains. It is a bit of a magic circle in my mind. <laughs> what makes pleases me the most is that the students there feel that it is as good as any other college in town. Although it is further away and in much cheaper construction, but nobody feels that there is any disadvantage being in Stiles or Morse as compared with being in Bramford, which I think is the best of all. <laughs> the general public liked it. The architects, modern architects did not, because they felt that Aero had not done a truly modern building. The fact that he did this kind of romantic arrangement, this, this was anathema for ma many architectural critics, and they were quite furious with Sarin. Sarin knew, it was interesting, as he was designing it, he knew that this was not going to be well seen by the press. But he felt that this was his responsibility towards the, under, towards the undergraduate students at Yale, to create a place, he says, where students can hang the romantic hat. <laughs> and, and, and it's true, they have that kind of character. But different as what more what the plan for courtyard would have, but they have that kind of character. You can imagine that you are in a romantic place in another period, another time in history, which is what the colleges do. And what now Bob Stern is doing much much more op openly. That would have been unthinkable in the, in the 60s, to do what Bob Stern is doing, which is a very historical design. The, the Coliseum was torn down not because it was disliked, it's because functionally it stopped working and, and, and it was not paying for itself. It was costing the city a great deal of money. Those were the arguments that I have read. I really never completely understood why the Coliseum was torn down, but the, the main reasons given were, were economical. The, the, the Coliseum never succeeded as a Coliseum. It was probably too small in too tight a site with very difficult parking. It, 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 New Haven did not have the site to build a good-sized Coliseum from the beginning. But those were the ambitions at the time, and they built it anyway. It's a pity because it was a very handsome structure, and it composed very well with the Knights of Columbus, both Kevin Roach buildings, and, and that was an image of New Haven. You knew that you had arrived at a very special city having those two buildings there. New Haven, when already when I was in Michigan, had a reputation for being a place that welcomed modern experimental architecture. And so architects that came to work in New Haven already felt that they were like on stage and they had to do something special, a, a bit more different than you would do in another normal town. And that was, I think that is a basic reason that has provoked this very extreme expressions, not so much for Sarin and perhaps a little with the Ingalls rig, but certainly it, it affected the work of Paul Rudolf and, and many others. Well, I think it's a very beautiful building. I think it's one of Lucan's two best buildings. I think the two, his two best buildings are the British Art Center and the Kimball Art Museum in, in Fort Worth, Texas. The, I like it much better than the Yale Art Gallery. The, art, the, the Yale Art Gallery, also look hands, is very important. It's a lovely building, but it's more important for historical reasons. As a building, I like the British Art Center better. It's a, it's a fantastic building. It's, it's, I like it because it's very, very regular. What is new in that building, what is innovative, is the use of that darker stainless steel. And uh, I think, as I, the story goes, that when Luke and visited the factories that were making stainless steel, he saw these sheets of dark stainless steel. This happened halfway through the process. And he says, I want it just like that. So that, that's what they specify. 
as it happened, and this is again stories I've been told, I'm not sure they are completely true, but the story is that the, the rejection was like 50%, so that nobody wanted to make that kind of stainless steel again, and nobody, no architects had been able to use it again, so only Luke can in that one building. <laughs> New Haven, they say that it has brutal abyss. The truth is New Haven doesn't have any brutalist buildings. The, the, the closest thing is a, the School of Architecture by Paul Rudolph, which is not really a brutalist building, and Paul Rudolph was not thinking of doing a brutalist building. You know, the brutalist doesn't mean that it was brutal. It came, this is a mistranslation. They all wanted to build things like Le Corbusier was doing in Beton Brie, which means rough concrete in French, but the word Beton Brie became brutal, maybe into English. And, 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 the, and indeed there are some buildings that you can call brutalist in England. The, the English were the ones that took to these morphs, more to heart, but not, in, not much in America. And, uh, and, but I think that the, the, the School of Architecture is a beautiful building, has many functional problems as most of rural buildings have, but it's a beautiful building. And I'm glad with the new renovation, the fact that it's now only one use, School of Architecture. It's a fantastic building. I'm very happy that we have it in New Haven. <laughs> you know, the interesting thing is that New Haven keeps on attracting architects. And the, this is a tiny city, you know, 127,000 people. And it has, I don't know, a huge number of architects, many of them very good, many of them working internationally. It's amazing. It's a great place. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> we, we love working here and, and you know, we work internationally. Now most of our, much of our work, about half of our work is in China now, and we have no problem working in China from New Haven. So I think I find that New Haven makes it a special city, is that it has a very intense cultural life. Not just in our, not only has a great number of great buildings, probably the, the number of great buildings were, were foot much better than New York or even Chicago. Chicago is phenomenal, but even better than Chicago. It's amazing the, such a tiny city to have so many great buildings, particularly so great, many great modern buildings. But the, the thing that attracts people and us, makes us, allows us to attract people here is the cultural life. The fact that we have great theater, great ballet, it's, it's, it's enormous amount of lectures, concerts, great art galleries. Two of them, two great art galleries, one across from the other. It's, it's amazing, it's a fantastic place. I think very highly of architectural preservation. I think preservation is one of the two movements that are given some spine and, and value to architecture today. One is preservation and the other is sustainability. And I think most architects today will try to do as much as they can to favor preservation and sustainability. And the combination is very, very healthy, among many other unhealthy trends. <laughs>